slides. I will now quickly switch one moment. Okay, let's do it from the beginning. Okay, so music therapy is something which some people may have heard of, but I am presenting it in the context of our current COVID-19 pandemic, as well as looking at how it intersects with experiential tourism. The reality is right now, where all of us are battling this relentless pandemic, a lot of people have been reaching out for music as one of the ways for them to cope with stress, as well as to deal with the physical distancing. And music therapy itself, which involves the strategic scientific application of music, is something which has been shown to have a lot of benefits on our mental health and to promote self-care as well as stress management. So what I'm going to be doing this afternoon is talking specifically about the ways that music therapy can combine with experiential tourism to be able to tackle some of the pressing needs that we are facing as a global community dealing with COVID-19. And this very much includes tourists who will be seeking to cater to as well. So we know that COVID-19 has a lot of primary physiological effects. But one of the things that the WHO has mentioned in its reports is they are expecting a second wave of pandemic, which is the impact of COVID-19 on mental health. Now, these are just very, very brief snippets that I've been able to gather recently, looking at some of the research that's been done, as well as more popular writing about COVID-19 and its effects on mental health. I will be just very, very briefly touching on this because there's a lot of information out there on the internet. But if you're looking specifically at what music therapy is, and I'm going to unpack for you what music therapy can do for mental health, looking at the needs of our tourists in the context of experiential tourism during COVID-19, we are primarily tapping into the qualities of music therapy, which are first and foremost evidence-based. It means that everything that we use and everything that we do in music therapy is evidence-based, it comes from research rigor, all the techniques that we use actually comply with certain standards of protocols that are also regulated under the World Federation of Music Therapy. It is also multidisciplinary in nature, which means that it intersects with psychology, with biological sciences, with medical science, and we really, really try to bring about the potential that music has to put us into an immersive, a reflective, and a relational experience. So one of the core components of music therapy is this therapeutic alliance, the relational aspect between therapists and client or clients. And we do a lot of individual work as well as group work. And both can be mobilized in the context of experiential tourism. It is multi-sensory because it engages all our five senses. It also caters to all our five levels of human functioning, be it psychological, mental, physical, emotional, and also uh, cognitive. It's adaptive and malleable because it's designed to fit a variety of different settings and circumstances. It also caters to different levels of severity. So we may have people who have more serious needs, but we also have people who have milder needs who are looking more for music as a means to engage themselves for purposes of general health and well-being. So we cater to all these different levels and we also are inclusive, which means we put a lot of emphasis on diversity, equality, as well as inclusion. And we work within a culturally sensitive framework. You might have heard music therapy often being mentioned in the context of special needs uh, education, for example. And so we are bringing together people from all walks of life, different ethnicities, different backgrounds, philosophies, and bringing them all together through music to participate in activities that will enhance their human functioning as well as their human needs. Now, you will notice here, it says strategic scientific uses of music. And these are the three main things that we do through music. We stimulate, we support, and we strengthen human functioning based on the levels that I mentioned just now. And we also shape their ability to respond to other people in their environment. If they are having conflict resolution issues, if they have problem solving within the community, music therapy is able to engage them in ways that helps to spur problem solving and helps to bond the community. We also look at the intersection of music and how it impacts the environment. And similarly, how our practices affect the way that we engage with our environment so that we can actually be more responsible and be more responsive to the needs of the environment. So I wanted to share with you this particular slide because in a nutshell, it presents to you all the major areas of health and well-being that music therapy caters to, but it also intersects a lot with 
many of the areas that you will be looking at in experiential tourism. I've attended sessions yesterday in which many of these things were also mentioned. So you can see that it has the potential to harmonize very well. I'm going to go beyond to look at how we as music therapists approach the relationship between music health and well-being. So we ask questions like, how can we use music to contribute towards better health and wellness outcomes? Is, are there more than one ways for music to be used to improve and support human health and so forth? A lot of the work that I myself am doing is involved in rehabilitation, but also to look at ways that we can prevent and we can maintain good health. And this is something which we are actually actively responsive based on the needs of the specific communities and the specific individuals that we're working with. We look a lot into the types of music, genres, musical styles. We look at historical context. We look at contemporary concepts. We use pop music. We use Western classical music. We use a lot of traditional music. So all types of music are amiable and possible to be utilized for purposes of therapeutic intervention. But a lot of it also has to do with how we define health and well-being according to the context of our individuals and communities that we are working with. So I wanted to share with you this quick diagram because it shows the intersection between how music therapy actually also coexists with community music. We look into the everyday uses of music in society, music education, as well as music medicine. Now, this is just a snapshot of how we might approach the use of music in a very strategic and specific way. So if we happen to be working with youth and youth have different needs, for example, from older adults, we are looking at the range of needs that are relevant to their health and well-being. And then how do we create music activities that will actually help to amplify and enhance the benefits across all these different areas? This is just one of the tools that we use because it's evidence-based. A lot of the time we are incorporating the latest uh, standards in terms of research rigor to look at what are the ways that we can also measure and we can offer ways to intervene with music that are quantifiable and something that we can also track, we can shape as well as monitor progress. So this is one of the things that also means we can collect data and we can monitor ongoing progress. And that's actually a very, very important part of what music therapy does. So what is the advantage of using music therapy in the context of mental health? And why are we talking about how music may be a potential way for us to incorporate uh, aspects of music therapy into existential tourism in a way that is functional, especially during these pandemics? We're talking about how music is often perceived as non-threatening. It's not invasive When you ask people to go and seek support, to perhaps talk to someone in a counseling context, a lot of time people have a lot of inhibition and they are reluctant to actually go and deal with these uh, pressing issues and challenges they have. And the reality is right now in COVID-19, a lot of us are suffering from anxiety. We have a lot of fear. We have fear of going out. We have fear of getting fined yesterday, as I heard from uh, one of the professional forums, and we are filled with this constant feeling of uncertainty. And it's like we have this dark cloud hanging over our heads all the time because we are worried about the ongoing pandemic situation. So the reality is, as much as we are catering to tourists in terms of the traditional sense, we know that COVID-19 has changed the face of how we do things, including tourism. And we have to look into the after effects and the impact of our ongoing COVID pandemic and what we can do to better address the mental health needs. I note from one of the keynote speakers yesterday that he actually mentioned how he believes tourism can also help to cater to mental health, and I fully agree with him. So I'm just demonstrating to you the ways that music therapy can be leveraged to help to support the mental health needs of our tourists and our community. So a lot of times, one of the advantages of music therapy is it bypasses mental health stigma because people don't expect music to be delivered in a context where they are also getting or receiving some form of therapeutic support, some kind of counseling support, but it is possible to incorporate the two very seamlessly. It also caters to all ages and stages. We can personalize it. It is family friendly. It can be applied to the CEO. I myself have done work uh, for stress management with big corporations, and these are stress executives who need some way to de-stress and to learn relaxation techniques. It works. It's a gentle way to ease in people who may be reluctant to get support to be uh, involved in some kind of therapeutic counseling. And it is also something that helps us to go beyond just R&R, &R, which we talk about rest and recreation. But here we are now looking into rest and restoration. 
And this is one of the ways that music therapy is able to ease people into that situation where they are getting the kind of mental health support they need, but very much through what looks like a very innocuous and inviting musical interaction. It also means that we can combine music therapy with mindfulness, with meditation. There's a lot of work being done in the US in this area, yoga, pilates, so you can see the potential for us to combine with many, many different aspects of rest and recreation, as well as health and well-being work. Music for self-care, I really, really cannot um, emphasize this enough. I think at this point, a lot of us are seeking ways for not just self-reflection and trying to rediscover our roots, but if we can use music as a way to strengthen self-identity while catering to self-care, this is something which I think we can use in the context of immersive tourism, experiential tourism, because it is encouraging people into that deeper engagement and interaction with uh, whatever experience that they are being delivered through the context of tourism, whether it's visiting a place and, and a region, or whether virtually just to have that safe space to be able to connect and to be able to deepen one's own understanding of self as well as one's own culture. And I brought in this uh, mention of SAPE because I think the SAPE has so much potential for music therapy and I'm actually very, very excited to see what we can do to look at ways that we can bring it into a therapeutic context, not just in Malaysia, but for the benefit of uh, everyone else around the world. It's such a beautiful instrument. So what are the things that we do in music therapy and how can we combine it with experiential tourism? So these are actual tried and tested techniques that I use that have already been developed in music therapy. The difference is I'm now bringing it across into this context of experiential tourism, but you can see at a glance where all of these techniques intersect with different aspects that are definitely uh, relevant and resonate with what experiential tourism aims to achieve. Now, the last one that is mentioned here, crisis intervention work, this is very specific and specialized. A uh, part of the work that I do with the World Federation is actually looking at communities in crisis. And I brought it in here because I noted yesterday there was a lot of mention of the word crisis and the need for us to be able to work through our current experience and to find ways to develop better coping tools, to be more resilient. And so this is actually one of the extensions of the work that we do in music therapy specific to crisis intervention. One of the things that um, you will also notice is music therapy actually combines very well with experiential tourism to support responsible tourism and sustainable cultural heritage. Now, there is the work of a cultural anthropologist, uh, the name of Alan Merriam, who mentioned that one of the important functions of music, he actually identified 10 psychosocial functions and roles of music in society. And functions eight, nine, and 10 actually talk about the very things that are relatable for a lot of our sustainable cultural heritage goals. So music actually has the potential to bring people together. It helps to engage and encourage different forms of social action, increases opportunities for social engagement and so forth, including problem solving in a non-confrontational and a peaceful way. And of course, it also increases cultural appreciation through music appreciation and for musicology. And we know that since the onset of COVID, there has been a lot of demand, a lot of need for us to use technology to not just upskill ourselves, but more telehealth and online platforms have opened up. And this is actually something that fits very well into the context of telehealth. In fact, a big area that has developed in music therapy since the onset of COVID-19 is virtual music therapy or telehealth. So music therapy during COVID-19, this is just an example from New Zealand. These are colleagues of mine who work in the World Federation as well. And they actually have used music as a therapeutic tool in the context of COVID-19 to achieve these goals in the community back home in New Zealand. And you can see, they talk about recording, reflecting their stories, celebrating New Zealand's cultural diversity, promoting interracial understanding, inclusive practices. And all these things are very much situated within the practice and the theory of music therapy. So as therapists, our voices resonate with you, the reader, I'm just using this term, we hope you will feel encouraged to reflect and share your own experiences, challenges, resourcefulness, guiding values as we continue to build individual collective resistance. Just to give you a glimpse of how we would apply music therapy technique in the context of our current COVID-19 to support mental health. But this is definitely something I'm sure that resonates with all of us here as well. So I just want to very briefly introduce to you, uh, the World Federation of Music Therapy is what uh, the, one of the organizations I belong to. And I'm 
just sharing this with you because there is going to be a lot of interaction down the road between uh, the work that I do and uh, UPM with the World Federation, as well as this other organization, the International Association for Music and Medicine. And you will see here that where the International Association of Music and Medicine goes beyond just conventional music therapy, it is also bring in, bringing in areas of music and the environment, and there are projects. I do encourage you to look up this project, Fragments of Extinction. It is just so encouraging to see what they are doing using music in the IMM to actually help to spur environmental awareness and to champion actually the undisturbed primary equatorial rainforest. So this goes into conservation work as well. And so this is actually something that we initiated in 2019 in UPM. This was under UPM and the Malaysian Society for Music and Medicine. But now there's going to be a next phase of the project being developed. And this is actually going to be together with IMM and the World Federation bringing all our entities together. And we are looking for collaborations as we are planning that will really, really serve the needs, not just of Malaysia, but also our global community. So I invite you, if you find what I have shared so far resonates with you and you're interested, please get in touch. And I'll be more than happy to see how we can work together moving forward. Last but not least, thank you so much for attending my session. Thank you, Dr. Indra, for such an insightful sharing on music therapy and giving us the uh, examples of how Music therapy can be to have so much potential in crisis intervention. Could you share with us if you have any examples of um, restoration or probably um, rejuvenation from music therapy session that you had before this? So a lot of the work um, I have been doing involves rehabilitation. So rehabilitation intersects with restoration because we are trying to recover either some form of damage functioning or we are trying to restore a patient's condition back to their original um, status as much as is possible. There's a lot of music therapy technique that has been applied. Uh, the most vivid example I can think of right now is the work that we've been doing at Chiras Rehab Hospital. Where we are directly working with stroke patients, we are working with patients who have traumatic brain injury. And this is ongoing work that has started since 2017, with Chiras Rehab. And so we are using music as a stimulus, as a catalyst to support the rehabilitation needs of the patient based on their primary treatment goals. So if I were to work with a medical doctor who specializes in stroke care versus someone who is a conservationist, for example, and now we are looking at ways that we can use music and harness its potential to rehabilitate the environment. We work very much in the context of a multidisciplinary team and we try to see what are the primary treatment goals, what is the uh, most pressing need for that particular environment or individual who has a chronic illness and then we design music activities specifically to achieve the same goals based on their primary treatment and needs. Thank you, Dr. Indra, for the sharing. We hope that music therapy can be widely used in terms of uh, using local context, local music culture as well. When one go to a place, time out of time, to experience, it's not just about uh, superficially participating, but immersing into music. And there's so much potential that we can see how one can engage himself or herself in music and to experience that transformation. All right, thank you again, Dr. Indra. Thank you so much, Julia. So now we will move to our second speaker of the session. Mr. Ryan is an expert on digital innovation and transformation in tourism, focusing on virtual, augmented or mixed realities. With an international professional background in hotel management, he has also worked with government departments on optimizing VR for tourism. We will now welcome Mr. Ryan Yoon to speak on experiential futures with virtual reality tourism. Thank you, Julia. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you again, Julie, for the kind uh, introduction. And I really enjoyed your presentation as well, Dr. Indra. Uh, surprisingly, 
even though we didn't plan this, a lot of our uh, research aligns along the same lines. I, I, I probably should have expected this, but yeah, I found it interesting. And a lot of your findings, strangely, I have also found in my own uh, research, even though we are so uh, different huh, in, in terms of uh, the directions that we're going in. So actually, my presentation today will be a little slightly out of left field. Uh, what I'm planning to talk to you guys about is how we can translate experiential tourism actually into the virtual form. Yeah. So, uh, Julia already did an excellent job in uh, introducing myself, but uh, just to follow on, uh, much of my expertise and uh, in my PhD projects were based around virtual reality. Most of the time for marketing, uh, as you can see, I have done master classes on using virtual reality for tourism experiences and tourism marketing. But before that, much of how I came to academia and came into this line of research was informed a lot by my own personal travels, right? So traveling around the world, at one point I was sleeping in my car. All this builds us up to who we are today and our life goals and how we achieve them. So moving on quickly from that, of course, at the moment now, because of our lockdown, so as Malaysia calls it, the MCO, uh, much of this is no longer accessible to large parts of the world. And uh, for better or worse, COVID-19 has actually seen this digital transformation and acceleration around the world by up to six years is the estimate. And this is really quite unsurprising, right? Because uh, just from 2019 to 2020, we've seen the year on year fall of about 1 billion arrivals globally, uh, an industry that's worth up to 1 trillion USD. So in response, a lot of these uh, tourism boards, as I've given some examples here, Germany, Ireland, Maldives, Japan, and many more, I'm sure, they themselves have launched uh, their own VR experiences, right? And the funny thing is, when I first started on this journey in 2016, 2017, many people, uh, even still today, tell me I'm ahead of my time, right? Because, yes, sure, virtual reality is still quite expensive and not very accessible to the general population yet. But now we have no choice, right? So if we see here in Japan, perhaps one of the more bizarre examples, uh, Companies like First Air, they're offering VR flights, which is quite incredible. So you sign up to come sit in a room and experience a virtual reality flight. Without COVID-19, do you think this would happen? I'm not sure, right? But uh, they, they saw like 50% increase in bookings and it's how de desperate people are to travel nowadays. Also, perhaps this is shifting our thinking, our paradigm into starting to accept virtual substitutes. Uh, some questions that you guys may already have in your mind is, isn't the work I'm doing going to eventually destroy the tourism industry? We'll see. But we, we are starting to see people start to accept the virtual substitutes of travel, right? And so why is this important? And this is where my research kind of aligns with uh, what Indra was saying earlier is because just from the lockdown and the inability to meet other people as well as travel, we've seen a lot of concerning drops in general well-being around the world, right? So I've, I've just included two here in the UK alone, the one in seven adults have suicidal thoughts just from the lockdown. Severe anxiety and depression is up by up to 23% as well. And loneliness, especially among older adults, has seen concerning increases. In China, 74% drop in general emotional well-being, right? And so whenever, when this was happening, I thought of this uh, quote that I read earlier. Note that this uh, Charles Muscle White said this in 2017. But of course, he didn't know that how, uh, how big of an impact this quote would be uh, once COVID-19 hit. He says, in a hypermobile world, uh, how will it feel to be one of the many older people who spend over 90% of their time in the home environment? How do we help them feel or experience mobility when literal mobility may be restricted or impossible. Of course, back then he was talking about using virtual environments for uh, this kind of uh, well-being and healing. Little did he know, just a two years later, not only is older people, right? Every single person on this planet is now in this 
predicament. And much like the music and the audio that uh, Indra was sharing with us, uh, tourism experiences, the, the actual experiential parts of our travel contribute to our mental health and well-being as well. Uh, as you can see from the seminal authors here, just from travel alone, oh no, sorry, uh, a sign of good subjective well-being is to have positive positive emotional responses, good life satisfaction, relative absence of anxiety, depression, general happiness. And like I said earlier, it's progress towards our valued goals, right? So I included some recent examples here. When we go on holiday and we it's a memorable tourism experience, uh, what they call a powerful on-site experience. This just contributes to our general individual happiness. And perhaps the bigger thing that we don't think about is some of uh, our life goals and how we achieve that through tourism. So Ming et al. here, they found that especially Chinese tourists, they many of them found achieved their life goals just by visiting these uh, authentic rural destinations to refine, I guess, their ancestral roots. All this now is out the window. So how do we harness these types of experiences? How do we translate the tourism experience or the experiential facets and immersive facets of tourism into the virtual space, right? My solution and proposition is to use virtual reality. So as I said, as we are stuck at home and people are more accepting of virtual substitutes, this could be one direction forward. So VR, AR, XR, all you virtual augmented reality, what's the difference between all of these things? The easy way to think of it is like this. Virtual reality, you are surrounded by the virtual environment. So it is the real world people like us going into a virtual space with augmented reality, much more of the real environment. So we are bringing digital facets into our real world space. I will be focusing more on the virtual reality side. So what exactly is virtual reality? We often uh, boil it down to these three facets, right? So visualization, the user should be able to look around, usually with a head-mounted device, as you can see in the picture here. There should be some form of immersion where you can suspend disbelief, and there should be some form of interactivity. If you have used a virtual reality device, you will know we use joysticks to control the experience. VR in tourism, in general, is not new. Uh, Really much of my expertise comes from the marketing area and how we use VR in destination marketing. So why is it so important and why is it so effective in virtual uh, in destination marketing? It's because virtual reality's greatest strength is to visualize these spatial environments and what uh, is crucial for intangible products, right? And what is more intangible than tourism? Can you preview a trip before you pay money? No, right? So this is the closest we can get to that. And that's why it's so effective. Uh, yeah, my own research has shown that virtual reality is much more effective than traditional media like pictures and videos because our emotional response to virtual reality when we are immersed inside there is much, much stronger. Unsurprisingly, we've seen the big boys start to uh, invest in the technology as well. Airbnb is starting to offer virtual reality previews of the rental spots. The kayak group, as you can see in the top right, I think that's Venice, where you can visit Venice before you actually book. And the Marriott group has also invested a lot in the technology. So you can put on the, uh, the virtual reality headset, have a brief experience of maybe your honeymoon destination, and then decide whether you want to book or not. Now, my current interest and my next new project is I want to ask the question, we've been using virtual reality to sell the tourism destination, right? What if virtual reality is the destination? Okay. A little bit of the theory side, right? Is how, what, what am I actually currently looking at? It's uh, social presence. So of course, the one, the biggest thing perhaps of the lockdown is that we are unable to have a lot of social interactions, right? So in the VR world or in the immersive technology world, this is something that uh, we are currently looking at. It's the subjective sense of being together. So the rate of social presence is how successful 
your technology is at emulating face-to-face -face communication. So such as people like us now, we are on Zoom and whatever your teams and this and that. It's not very close, right, to emulating face-to-face -face communication. We, are, we seldom look directly into the camera. It's very difficult to uh, look for social cues and so on. So I've given you a few examples uh, of how this is actually studied in virtual reality. Uh, it's whether or not there are virtual characters around that are interacting with the same environment you're in, uh, whether the same virtual characters obey any depth cues, whether when you bump into things you feel haptics or not, whether social cues are accurate, and of course, what are the personality of these virtual characters that are with you in the environment. So when I combine all these theoretical stuff together, what do I get? When, I speak, when we look at the research on virtual reality gaming and training, uh, yeah, again, very much like what uh, Dr. Indra was saying, actually it's used a lot right, to, improve, to improve well-being among adults with uh, disabilities. So virtual reality gaming is actually used a lot in uh, cyber psychology therapy and PTSD and things like this. They also introduce a lot of fun and coping mechanisms to children ho hospitalized with cancer introduce uh, an element of fun and dynamism to physiotherapy of stroke patients and general social well-being in clinical settings it's used a lot now the this research by chirico and gaglioli really put me onto my current uh, interest right is they they found that there was no real significance uh, significant difference emotionally when they tested virtual reality landscapes versus real world landscapes. So that's quite incredible. That means if I walk out to my garden and the emotional and happiness I received from that, they found was no much difference or no significant difference than doing the same thing in virtual reality. And then this other thing that I'm proposing is virtual reality could actually potentially be even more powerful in terms of social uh, subjective well-being that when we compare it to on-site experiences. Now, maybe you're thinking, Ryan, you're talking nonsense. How can the virtual version be better than the real version? If we look at the literature on subjective well-being by this guy called Heathwood, the goals that we achieve in tourism is actually our idealized goals. So the, what makes us happy and the thought of happiness comes from what we think is ideal in our tourism. Whether or not it's ideal, that's another case when we go to the actual destination. So I present to you this picture. This is the Great Wall of China, right? Is this our ideal scenario if I am going to visit the Great Wall? On, at first glance, my general uh, personal opinion is yes of course i want to visit the great wall when there's absolutely nobody there right there's no people crowding around me there's you know not a uh, tour guide's flag in the, in front of my face so maybe this could be the ideal scenario for uh, my trip of course this is not possible in real life right so in virtual reality if i recreate the great wall it could be my ideal tourism scenario. And if this is my life goal, then I can achieve it in a much better way. For someone else, they might feel that this is too unnatural, right? It's too eerie. If I go to the Great Wall and I, there's not a single person over there, it's too weird. I, I get taken out of the experience. Long story short is we don't know because we haven't done any research in this uh, area yet. So what did I go and do? I did a bunch of experiments. Uh, I did some within subjects experiment design and today's presentation, I focused more on the interview side. I worked with my industry partner, Digital Frontier, who are based out of China. Um, and we compared virtual reality video and photographs uh, for 72 participants. Oops, yep, that's Digital Frontier. So this experience was a cruise ship. Uh, participants put on their head mounted devices like this. And the crucial thing to point out here is that everything you're seeing now, which they saw, nothing is real. Everything they saw was completely computer generated based on blueprints by Princess Cruises. 
So in the experiments, I basically asked them uh, what differences did they find, uh, whether it was a good experience, how did they feel emotionally, so on and so forth. And these three main themes came out of that. The first being visual re representation and the social cues, as I mentioned earlier with my social presence stuff, uh, context dependent, subjective well-being, and then the acceptance of virtual tourism for aims and goals. In terms of the visual representation, as I said earlier, for most of us, we think that we want to visit a lot of these tourism attractions uh, and it to be completely empty. Not so. So in terms like the crew setting, as you can see in the top right picture, this is what they were looking at. A lot of them were didn't like that there is no that there are no one there. So in the experience, there was no other virtual characters or no other no other users. Basically, you were walking around this cruise ship by yourself. They thought it was too lonely. Second person said, uh, "Traveling is about socializing," and he thought it was too sterile. Right? If I'm walking around this such a huge cruise ship by myself, is very unnatural. So, failed it. But there were some people who managed to find uh, positives as well. And this is where I bring in this, the context, right? So in areas where they were just focusing on, especially the sea, the sunset and this and that, they, uh, this was much more effective. So in the first one here, it says with the virtual reality, she felt really calm because she was able to just sit there and watch the sunset, right? With no one disturbing her at all. Second person, he noticed the waves, he felt natural, he looked at the sun, sky, sea, and so on. And uh, Jaden, he was actually, he used to be in the Navy. And this brought back many, many good memories for him just from putting on this headset. So in specific context, it can work. Oh, Julia says two minutes left, okay. So virtual tourism for subjective well-being and our aims and goals. How do we do that? Uh, I'll skip the first one for time, but the main thing I found was for people like Kara here, she said the chances of me going bungee jumping, she will never do it in her lifetime just from psychological fear. But with virtual reality now, she would be able to do something like this, right? So this could be a replacement. And as you can see, people like Samsung already thought of this before me. They've built theme parks where you can do virtual reality bungee jumping. So in this case now, we are moving the conversation away from tourist, virtual reality as a complement to sell the real trip to a replacement, right? People like Kara here would never do bungee jumping anyway. So why not we build it for her to do it in virtual reality? And that doesn't even uh, speak about other barriers such as physical or social, right? Uh, a lot of socially acceptable behaviors you may not be able to do. So here are some uh, recommendations for developers and so on in uh, who are interested in going down this path. Certainly, developers should focus on nature or invest in virtual characters, which is very, very expensive. Uh, even just introducing silhouettes can be uh, beneficial or focus on effective storytelling. Why, logically, are there no other people in this area? Okay. Uh, like I said, for the researchers here, we are moving the conversation from virtual reality as a complement to virtual reality as a replacement. So second chance tourism for places like the Bagan temples, we can't visit them anymore anyway. So with 3D scanning technology, why not let the future generations do so? And I haven't even started talking about fantasy locations. Would you like to visit uh, uh, King's Landing from Game of Thrones? Maybe. Further research down the line. What about introducing other senses like music, audio, and so on may even elevate this experience even further. And then, of course, eventually we'll end up with neural, right? If our brain believes it is true, does it matter whether it's real or not? Uh, Multi-user VR, yes, if, to increase even our social presence inside. And I actually want to present everyone. Uh, this current research gives us more questions than answers, really. What about the policies around virtual travel? If you visit a virtual version of Paris, does the tourism board of Paris, are you considered a tourist there? Do you pay tourism tax to visit the virtual version of certain places? A lot of unanswered questions there. And then do we redefine the word tourism? At the moment, it's when you spend more than 24 hours in a place that is not your home. If I'm sitting at home, but my brain is in a different place, am I a tourist or not? 
a lot of unanswered questions. What happens to the tourism-based industries, all our hotels, the uncle down the street selling his bun near the airport? All of that goes away, right? If we go to virtual and then like this, HTC already is starting to hold virtual events in virtual reality. What happens then? Is the convention industry dead? I don't know. That's it from me. Hopefully everyone managed to gain something. Uh, Julia is also <laughs> rushing me. So if you have any questions, yeah. Thank you very much for coming. If you are interested, please, you can reach out to me at any of these. Thank you, Ryan. I like the way you present two sides of the coin in virtual tourism about what is, is uh, possible and not possible and how people think and receive uh, the technology. Anyway, it's interesting to see technology creates possibilities for alternative experience beyond space and time. And I particularly see this also as inclusive tourism, such as those who are physically challenged to have a chance to travel far. And they also get the opportunity to actually experience rather than not at all. So thank you again for a very inspiring talk. And I look forward to see more virtual tourism and your work in future. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. So now we will move to our third speaker, Ms. Emilia Rosiman. She is one of the outstanding pioneers of business events Sarawak. She has over 13 years of experience in branding, marketing and PR and has contributed towards a total win of 15 awards for Sarawak in creative marketing campaigns. To date, she has won five professional awards. Let us now invite Ms. Emilia to share with us on experiential travel with business events. Thank you, Dr. Julia. Ooh, ha. Um, that's the Sarawak Ken Chan uh, when we welcome each other. Hello, everyone. Okay, let me share my slide first. All right, thank you for having me at the um, ICRPH 2021. And it is a great pleasure to speak among such an inspirational bunch, just like uh, Mr. Ryan and also Dr. Indra, and share my experiences with such a great audience. So Dr. Julia has shared a very kind introduction of me professionally. So however, I hope you don't mind if I give you a deeper insight to that as a short background of my presentation. So I'm an adventurer at heart. From visiting the seven original world wonders like Machu Picchu to discovering every corner of my own backyard in Sprawa, I must say that I am so lucky to be given so many opportunities to experience wonder and excitement. By having this privilege and being in the business events industry, it has definitely inspired many of my professional and personal views on experiential travel. It has also shaped the way my organization, Business Events Rawa, is responding to the current uncertainty of the pandemic. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, here's a quick background on what we do. Business Events Rawa was formed in 2006 by the Sarawak government and the first the first convention bureau in Malaysia. Our core objective is to function as a marketing agency under the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture Strawa in growing Strawa as business event destination. We support events planners who wish to bid, to host, and to organize business events that consist of conventions, exhibitions, corporate meetings, and corporate incentives in Strawa. So traditionally, business event was also known as MICE and was considered as a sector that contribute to tourism. However, the global movement of business event industry eventually advocated that business events do more than just contributing to visitors' numbers. So it, it is itself a um, self-sustaining industry that has the potential to bring income, development, and social change. So experiential travel has become a popular term for travel marketers, but it can mean different things 
to different people. For me, experiential tourism or travel is, is the opposite of conservative mass tourism that focus on packaged words and vacation with low level of personal involvement. Experiential tourism encourage traveler to actively participate in the experience and promote activities that draw people to engage at all, all the five senses of a traveler. So for a business event, experiential travel is not something entirely new. In fact, the principle of experiential travel is one of the key components for us to win our business. As what you see on the screen, these are the components under business events where experiential travel is involved. Don't worry, I will go through this one by one with all of you. All right, the first component is pre and post -wear. I'm I'm sure most of you are very familiar with this when you are attending conventions or exhibitions. You know, the heart of the uh, the heart to heart with the Orang Utan program is a key highlight that I had a privilege of kicking uh, of kickstarting. So this unique activity allows participants to gain a deeper understanding of the challenges faces and to actively participate in orangutan conservation by compressing a variety of education and conservation activities into a single day. So the participant learned from a dedicated team of Sarawak forestry experts about the challenges around Utan rehabilit rehabilit rehabilitation. Get to work hands-on performing everyday conservation activities at Matang Wildlife Center, such as pre preparing the burlap sack, containing foods such as insect, peanut, young leaf, etc. etc. So we also bring participants to the Semenggo Wildlife Center to see the result of the successful orangutan um, program. All participants receive a certificate acknowledging their contribution to Strawa Orangutan Conservation Program, and you may even adopt a baby orangutan if you wish to. So the second component is networking session. With business events, the possibilities of incorporating something experiential is endless, especially when making meal or break time arrangement for social events. So the 55th ICA Congress, um, or known as International Congress and Convention Association Congress 2016, is something actually very dear to my heart. This event was attended by 1,000 delegates from 64 countries gathered in Kuching, Sarawak. The theme of this Congress is redefining Ika global tribes. So the second component um, is networking session. With business events, uh, yes, I think that's what the slide we're talking about. I'm sorry, I missed the slide. So, all right, okay, I'm back on track. We wanted the participants to experience something truly memorable and Sarawakian, um, for Sarawakian very much, you know, something like Rainforest World Music Festival, which is always being held in July. However, the ITA Congress is traditionally always on the second week of November every year. So there's a big clash here. So we decided that we are going to recreate our own Rainforest World Music Festival at the official venue of the festival at Sarawak Culture Village, just for the Congress networking dinner called the Cat Night. So as I mentioned earlier, the Congress theme was redefining global tribe. Following through this theme, we got each regional chapter to express their creativity and create their own regional chapter tribe through face painting. Then they had to compete against each other in various games that tested their strength, wits, and overall tribal spirit. My gosh, you know, I, I still can remember how competitive and fun it was. The energy from the participants and then the spectators continue to give me goosebumps. And, and the fun didn't stop there. 
After the dinner and games, we got everyone together for a workshop and involved playing music instruments guided by our local artists and their peers cheering for them on by dancing all the way. It was such a heartwarming experience for everyone because we were all brought together by our love of good times, music, and tribal unity of the Global Business Events family. Well, the third component is the out-of-the-box session. I consider this an, an, as, uh, an amazing way to take participants out from their comfort zones and expose them to things um, and experiences that are completely new to them. With this component, we develop a community library program in conjunction with the Asia Pacific Regional Hub for 56 ICA Congress. So this is not a typical CSR program where delegates or hosts merely donate books to a library and are done with it. We want them to make it fully immersive and experiential by developing two out-of-the-box sessions that will engage delegates during pre and post Congress. So this is then combined with three days to night tour of um, Nanga Ukum Long House at Patangai um, with activities such as cooking, hiking, longboat riding, and basically experiencing a truly authentic Iban's way of life. Yet, the most important part of this program lies in the renovation of this old and abandoned building. The participants were working together with the Iban Longhouse people to transform this old building into the Batang Ai Community Library. It was a lot of hard work and not to mention the, logis the logistical um, challenges um, involved in carrying a few thousand books from the jetty to the library that's situated on top of a hill. Nevertheless, we persevered and as you can see, the building has been transformed and the program has been a successful. For your information, we managed to raise 7,500 books from our 500 book challenge campaign with book donations from people around the world. Our exclusive sponsor of this project is Rawa Energy Berhad and many other um, corporate sponsors. So for the first year, the building will serve its purpose as a mini library only. Currently, we are collecting data from nearby longhouses in Matang Ai with the help of um, Nanga Ukum's longhouse chief that will enable us to set up actual teaching program for the children. My team and I were directly involved with this and it has been a life-changing experience um, even for us. For some of us, um, even like me, it brought back um, memories of our humble beginnings, just like the youth of Patang Ai. Um, education brought, um, has been a means not to just break the cycle of poverty, but a ticket in life to achieve our dreams. With this library, we hope to offer the same inspiration to the youth of Patang Ai area. We are blessed to have a local champion like the Longhouse Chief, whose strong will has led his community and other longhouses nearby to embrace these changes. Well, the last component I would like to share with you is corporate incentives. Here, we took inspiration from Seven Wonders of the World to develop the Seven Wonders of Sarawak as an incentive trip. This was a six days, five nights um, program to Kuching, Mulu and Miri for our Australian and Singaporean incentive groups. We basically threw them into the heart of Sarawak's finest and most memorable aspects, allowing them to experience activities such as kayaking at Samadang, the Bidai village. In the morning, on the way to the kayaking area, we stopped by 10 mile shops to shopping for Adidas Kampong. I'm not sure how many of you knows Adidas Kampong. 
Well, Adidas Kampong is a uh, rubber shoes that are very popular among the local hikers and villagers. And it was also fun for the participants to see um, our local products too. And then the kayaking first started. There were kayaking for almost one and a half hour and they showcased the amazing energy as a team and enjoyed the breathtaking, breathtaking view of Samadang River. In the middle of nowhere, we also set up a surprise for the participants, which involves a welcome ceremony and celebration hut erected directly um, by the river. And this is where all the activities were held. So when the participant arrived, they were welcomed with traditional Bidayu dances and Tua, our rice wine by the local. And they were also personally greeted and welcomed by the village, uh, village chieftain who shared with them some personal stories about the Bidayu people and their beliefs, especially the do's and don'ts when you are in the jungle or right in the middle of the river, nowhere. And this created such a strong sense of connection with the participants. The participants also learned how to cook ayam panso, chicken in a bamboo, meat in salad, our local fern, and the best part is sago worm. It was so entertaining to see the reaction of the participants preparing the worm. They were screaming, they were laughing, there were a lot of money things. Personally, this was my highlight. We also make a special arrangement to bring the green ladies of Sarawak. They are from a subtribe of the Bidayu's indigenous group wearing a traditional necklace called Tumbe. Um, the women started wearing the yellow copper rings when they were around 10 and have continuously worn them since um, as they are as a sign of beauty and prestige. According to the Bidayu community, this is a tradition that has been passed down for generations. This is, I can say that definitely a lifetime experience, not only for the instance group, but also for us as well. All right, at its very core, experiential travel with business event involves the following. The first one is hands-on experience from a local perspective. Each component manifests this by offering participants the chance to learn and experience actively something that they are not normally exposed to. Second, authenticity. As you can see that um, Sarawak experience is very much cultural and environmental. We attempt to preserve the belief and the way of life of our iconic components, such as the ring ladies and the orangutans by telling their own story and reenacting a story and inviting the sitter to become personally involved in the story. Number three is touching the senses. In Sarawak style business event, it's all about engaging the senses in order to leave a memory. We want participants to remember Sarawak through the five senses of the taste of the food, the sound of the jungle and tribal song, the beautiful views, the sensation of unity, the smell of the forest, and many more. Number four is exclusive access. Securing unique venues such as the exclusivity use of Sarawak Culture Village and to create an event synonym with the brand of Rainforest Group Music Festival for Cat Night is such a privilege for the participants to be able to experience something special created just for them. And number five is takeaways. And most, you know, most importantly, we want our participants to feel that they have either learned something or contributed to a valuable cause. With our Strawa Tribal Wisdom Program, it is uniquely crafted to inspire the delegates or participants to learn and garner tribal values and see where it can be applied to the business world today. So business events also is all about customization to the needs of the planner. With the current pandemic situation, we have initiatives 
in place to ensure the confidence of the planners organizing their events and the confidence of the delegates attending their events in Strava. And, and I also want to um, share that our assistant is all the way you know, to the success of your event. Well, that's all from me. Do drop me a question at the chat box. Thank you once again for inviting me to speak. Stay safe. Ooh ha! Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Julia. Thank you, Ms. Amelia, for sharing with us concrete examples of a spiritual tourism in the beautiful place of Sarawak. I think Sarawak really has a lot to offer. And it's good to hear that how these activities not only bring visitors to have a meaningful time, but also bring advantages or benefits to the local communities. Um, yeah, we do have question in the chat. And it's a very interesting question that brings the three uh, sessions together, three um, uh, talk together. And I'll just read the question. Um, what is your opinion, Ms. Amelia, as business, business events operators towards the implementations of VR tourism in near future as it might take over the need to have a convention center? And there's another question for Dr. Indra as well, if you would like to share in terms of music events in VR. So over to you first, Amelia. All right, thank you so much, um, Dr. Julia. Okay, the question here is that, what is my opinion as business events operator? So when, when it's mentioned business events operator, I would um, think that um, we are the organizer of the event. Uh, I believe, um, but actually, you know, um, for the uh, business, be it Sarawa or business event, we are the convention bureau. We do not organize any, um, uh, we do not organize conferences or organizing any events. We are, we collaborating with the local host, professional conference organizer, um, exhibit, uh, exhibition producer, and also destination management company, as well as event manager, uh, the event management company. Um, however, as a bureau, um, as a marketeer for the state government, we actually we are looking into the VR um, in the virtual reality to promote our venue and our products. Yeah. So, um, might take over the needs of a convention center. Well, in the near future, maybe another 20, 30 years. But you know, um, business event is about face-to-face -face meeting. So I believe that nothing still can beat that. You know, while we are still on it and we still can hang on it, I think we should, you know, still trying to get our face-to-face -face meeting going on. I mean, when the times come when the virtual reality will take over the whole world and the whole universe, you know, when the times come, yes. Maybe there's no need for the commission center, but I think for now, for the next 50 or 100 years, we hope that face-to-face -face meeting is still there. And you know, by saying it doesn't mean that we are not going for AR or VR. We are going for it, but it will be a teaser and it helps us to promote the destination. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Could we have uh, Dr. Intra to share with us on this topic? So it's a very good question. Thank you so much for asking it. There is a lot of potential, of course, um, for virtual reality and music to combine. And actually, there are already attempts to bring music concerts and virtual reality together. It's also something that's been done with online gaming, and it creates really, really dynamic and exciting experiences. I think the explorations that began before COVID were already showing a lot of potential. But you can imagine right now, because of the urgency of the situation, this is something that opens up a really important exploration. I'm particularly inspired by what uh, Ryan was sharing and what Dr. Julia mentioned when we talked about the potential for application into inclusive settings. Because one thing that's for sure is 
we have a lot of ongoing struggles as a regular population, so to speak, dealing with COVID. But I do know for a fact that the level of struggle and frustration among special needs families, not just in Malaysia, but worldwide, is much, much more. And if we could find a way to bring the kind of VR and music experiences that will provide opportunities for simulation of real world experience. One of the things that we do a lot with special needs populations is we try to recreate real world situations to help to develop communication, speech uh, skills, especially when we talk about learning social interaction skills, all these that are extremely functional as daily living skills. And very often special needs uh, individuals are cut off from society for reasons that they don't always find it comfortable interacting in a regular way. So we already do the work to try to simulate and recreate through music therapy, for example, ways to get them to engage and practice these real world skills, but in a safe therapeutic setting. I can only imagine if we incorporate VR into it, it will really, really take it to a whole different level. So there is a lot of potential for us to take this technology further and to combine. And I really, really look forward to exploring the possibilities, but there is some existing work, but I do believe that COVID has highlighted an urgency on a totally different level. Thank you. Thank you, Indra. Uh, Raya, would you like to add on to what you have commented in the chat room? Yep, sure. So I think uh, the question was possible advice I'm not sure if I have uh, really any advice for someone as experienced as Miss Amelia, but I think in general, uh, yeah, much of what I've been researching as uh, correctly critis the critique from, from a lot of my colleagues is, yes, I'm ahead of my time because the technology at the moment cannot really support what we are trying to do yet. So we are waiting for the hardware side to catch up. So things like... Uh, Really, Amelia's whole presentation, the whole experiential side of, of business events is really, you can't translate that experience to virtual reality yet. Um, like it or not, uh, yes, conferences like this uh, bring us together, but also I would be so much more powerful, right, to meet all of you in person. And I don't think at the moment this can be uh, replicated yet in the virtual setting. Uh, like I said in my typed comment, I... I think though, because of how much or how quick acceleration of the digital transformation has uh, been urgently forced upon us, I think business meetings in general will see a drop off uh, what, as we say, in the new normal, right? Because I think many of us have realized now that probably half of the face-to-face -face meetings that we have is really unnecessary. And when you think about all for those of you in the academic setting, you know our Pro Vice Chancellors fly halfway around the world for a two-hour meeting and then fly back. If we think of the climate impact of that, is it really necessary for people to fly around like this? Probably not. So if we can recreate that kind of setting in whether uh, any virtual setting, I'm sure that will be one solution. And just to finish off uh, uh, with what Julie and Indra were saying, uh, I didn't get around to it, but there are my colleagues in Italy and Germany, I know, who are working on this more accessible side uh, of tourism using VR. So what they're trying to do is for families to be able to visit places like uh, like glowworm caves, right? Uh, people with uh, physical problems, obviously, they can't abseil down into the glowworm caves, but they shouldn't miss out on that opportunity to visit these caves as well and then be able to discuss your tourism memories as a family so that I know that's something that they're already doing at the moment and of course the last and final thing is everything I speak about is uh, very targeted towards those of us who are at the front of the innovation queue but we cannot forget that probably half of our global population is from the middle to back right so yeah, maybe if virtual tourism comes around or virtual events, I should say, uh, that will only cater to those of us who are willing to do so, right? When many people will likely choose not to. So, yeah. I'm um, Dr. Julia. Yeah, I add to what um, Ryan said just now. Okay, thank you so much. Well, you know, um, 
I think it's quite interesting the remark that you, I mean, the same one that you were saying just now about business events, meeting and conference, you know, with the situation, you know, um, talking about, you know, like the existing of the industry um, or conference association and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but, you know, like personally, I believe that in general, in whatever we do, we need to find a balance. You're not like going so much. I mean, it's finding a balance does not mean that we are refusing to change. Changing and adopting, it can be two different things. But, you know, like a drastic change and accelerating the change is two different things. So for business events, I believe that, you know, a lot of my colleagues and my industry, uh, my peers in the industry, we adopt to changes. But what is, you know, what uh, we adopt to the changes, but it does not mean that we do not want to change at all. VR, AR, all those technology are very good. It has been a very handy during this um, pandemic times, you know, that look at us today, we can't meet, but we still can meet virtually. But one day when the COVID is not here anymore and you know the skies are open, we still can meet and do the conventional stuff, you know, like meeting the real convention, meet to, you know, face to face, eye to eye. So what I'm trying to say here, my point is balance is very important. We can go ahead of our time, we can, but at the end of the day, if we the only thing that we have is virtual world. And the actual case, the one you're talking about, the family are enjoying, is not there anymore. What's the point? So that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all the uh, opinions uh, on the question. I really find the questions very insightful and it leads us more into a deeper discussion. And yeah, I do personally see VR as it's substitute, like what Ryan used, it's a kind of substitution, but it's not a total replacement. It's just bring out more alternatives and possibilities. And I do agree with uh, Amelia that um, it's important to actually continue to have humanistic value in technology, along with technology. Um, yeah, Dr. Indra, would you like to add on? Sorry, I have to unmute, sorry for that. Um, so I love that this question has been uh, posed because it really, really highlights the crossroads that we are at. And COVID has just uh, increased the urgency to look into alternative options and to bring in other forms of therapy to address the ongoing issues as well as future needs. I really, really see it from a therapeutic perspective as VR in part also being a bridge towards face-to-face -to -face interaction in the future. When I was mentioning just now about how important this whole process of simulation is, and we are talking about people who would otherwise not dare to step into a live interaction, but can be safely led through this VR, or we could talk about an in-between phase journey, where they're getting to experience similar conditions. Ryan gave a very good example just now about the girl who was afraid of going bungee jumping in real life. But if she can experience it to VR technology, then it makes her feel comfortable enough to go through with it. But let's say she does do it, and it could be for every other experience as well, not just bungee jumping. And then she decides, actually, it's quite a fun thing to do, and I would like to now take it to a real world experience. So we're talking about VR also serving as an important bridge. I mentioned the simulation aspect and how important it is, especially for those segments of population who would otherwise not be interested or not be very open to experiencing things in the real world. I think this is something which we can look as part of a continuum as well. And that is very much something that I think adds value and opens up more possibilities for us to really, really experience tourism in all its fullest potential. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I think we have to close the session because we have the closing ceremony at 3.30. Thank you again, Dr. Indra, Mr. Ryan, and Ms. Amelia for your sharing. And thank you to all the participants for your question and also for joining us.
Take care.